Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Gwyneth Milbrath. I am a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing and the associate director for global health. Uh, today is May 4th, 2022, and I am excited to talk to you today about one of my favorite areas, uh, climate change and disaster nursing. My personal background is as an emergency department nurse, um, and I have also have uh, expertise in public health and disaster nursing as well. So I'm very interested in this topic, and I hope that today that you can learn something. So just to start off, um, we're just going to talk briefly about what is climate change. So the United Nations defines climate change as a long-term shift in temperature and weather patterns. These temperature shifts can be natural, but since the, or since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, particularly due to the burning of fossil fuels, which includes coal, oil, and gas. And these produce gases that trap heat and drive up the temperature. Now, climate is not the same thing as weather. So climate is um, a more long-term average weather condition, whereas weather is an hourly or daily variable change on a local scale. So one thing that you can think about is that with weather, it's more like what you decide to wear every day. Whether it's raining, you put on a jacket and some rain boots. If it's snowing, you put on some warm clothes. Um, if it's hot, you might wear shorts or a t-shirt or a bathing suit. That's your weather. Your climate is more about what type of clothes do you have in your closet. So if you live in Canada, you're going to have a lot more warm weather clothes than if you live in Mexico where it's a lot warmer on average. One of the main drivers of climate change is uh, what we call the greenhouse effect. Um, and the greenhouse effect is natural. It helps keep our, our planet warm. So the radiation and the heat comes from the sun into the atmosphere onto the earth. The earth reflects back some of that heat into the atmosphere. Some of that heat is lost and some of the heat is trapped through what we call greenhouse gases like CO2 um, that keep the heat in the atmosphere. So some greenhouse gases are good, otherwise we would lose a lot of heat um, and it would not keep the earth warm. But too many greenhouse gases can overheat the earth, um, resulting in less heat as escaping into space um, and an increased average temperature. Think about it if you're exercising, you're producing heat either way, but if you're exercising wearing a t-shirt or short sleeve shirt versus wearing a sweatshirt or a jacket, you're gonna insulate and keep a lot more heat in the jacket and your body temperature is gonna be higher that way, even though that you're producing the same amount of heat through your exercise. So one of the questions that people ask is, how do we know that climate change is real? Because of the variability of temperature on a daily basis, it's hard to prove uh, if climate change is happening over a long period of time, especially when we're talking about very far in the past before we were able to take scientific measurements of the temperature and record them. However, scientists can look at things like tree rings or other natural records to estimate uh, climate around the world uh, earlier uh, in time. And from these observations, they have um, determined that the average temperature now is warmer than it has been for at least the last 1,300 years. Um, specifically, the last 50 years, average temperatures have increased dramatically, especially at the North and the South Pole, um, which is important because of the ice caps. The ice caps reflect a lot of heat um, and keep the heat from absorbing, so keeping our, our temperature um, in homeostasis and, and um, where it should be. But as the ice melts, less heat is being reflected out to space, and so the Earth will continue to get warmer. Um, natural processes driving Earth's long-term climate variability don't explain the rapid climate change that we've seen in the last recent decades, uh, which corresponds to rapid 
expansion, development, urbanization, and burning of fossil fuels. So here is an example of a graph that shows the variability in air temperature over time starting in 1880 through the year 2020. Um, and the graph shows temperature fluctuations of um, average per year. The blue line is each year and the red line is an average over five years. And as you can see, there's a lot of variability each year, which is normal. However, Overall, you can see in the last, since 1940, um, the temperatures have uh, on average increased pretty dramatically. So why do we care about climate change? Um, I live in Chicago where it's very cold and you know I would, I would like it to be warmer. However, that's not exactly what global warming or climate change means. Um, it does mean that on average the world is experiencing warmer temperature, um, but it also means that it's having more rainfall in some areas and droughts in others, as well as more intense storms. Um, glaciers are retreating um, or melting. Um, sea levels are rising due to melting glaciers and ice caps. And climate zones are shifting, meaning that areas that used to be very cool are now more warm. Areas that were temperate are now becoming tropical. Um, and some areas are becoming um, that were getting rainfall are now having droughts. Um, a lot of these changes are irreversible at this point, um, and we may be continuing to see more changes um, to a point where we might not be able to go back, and there will be irreversible irreparable damage from climate change. Now what does this have to do with health? Um, we'll talk about that here in a bit, but there are severe health impacts related to climate change, um, including illness due to extreme heat, as well as issues with agriculture due to drought and extreme heat, um, which are expected to happen more frequently as well. So what are the some of the drivers of climate change? There are some natural drivers, such as volcanoes. They produce large amounts of greenhouse gases when they erupt and can cause climate changes um, in confined areas that can last weeks to months. Now, if there were to be a massive volcanic eruption, um, we could see climate change for a longer period of time, and that would be a natural, very um, violent change in climate. Um, also, solar irradiance, meaning energy from the sun. Obviously, that's our main energy source here on Earth, so changes in the amount of energy coming from the sun would obviously drive changes in the climate. However, we haven't seen large impacts from these natural drivers. Pollutants, however, do cause climate changes such as greenhouse gases, which include carbon dioxide, methane gas, nitrous oxide, urbanization, um, and land usage. Um, land usage, as we talked about, ice caps melting decreases the reflection, as well as um, increased urbanization, development, paving of roads, increases the amount of heat that is absorbed into the land. Um, additionally, economic growth drives climate change. Countries that have higher incomes also have higher energy usage. However, we may start to see a reversal as higher income countries are investing in more green or um, environmentally friendly initiatives, such as solar powers, um, electric cars, green buildings, those um, more mass transportation, that type of thing. Um, population growth, uh, the global population has increased, I think, by 87% since 1970, and so more people is going to equal more emissions. Um, as well as infrastructure, so transportation, whether it's public versus private transportation, so more public transportation is going to decrease um, emissions, which will decrease the rate at which climate changes. Um, also, a lot of our infrastructure does have a high output of um, fossil fuels and greenhouse gases, so it is very expensive to replace these with more low carbon options. Um, however, that will be something that uh, will be necessary in the future to try to decrease the carbon footprint. Um, also, global supply chains, if you think about um, flying, uh, uh, flying across the Atlantic Ocean or um, global shipping on barges, those require large amounts of fuel. 
So here's an example of, um, let's say, making a, a shirt. So let's say the cotton comes from the United States at number one. It gets shipped over. The cotton gets sh sh sorry, shipped to Jap uh, Japanese mill in Japan where they mill the cotton into cloth. It then goes to number three in Malaysia to a factory where they cut um, they cut the cloth. They send it to Hong Kong where it and other pieces are consolidated from a specific brand or types of shirts or whatever it is. And then from Hong Kong, it gets distributed worldwide to distribution points, maybe in Europe, Australia, North and South America. So you can see the journey of one shirt is, um, is global. Um, and so the more that we can keep food and um, products local, um, the less of a, of a carbon footprint that we have and more environmentally friendly things are. So how does climate change impact health? So you can see here increasing CO2 levels rising temperatures, more extreme weather, and rising sea levels, and all cause um, these climate changes, such as air pollution, changes in vector ecology, meaning uh, vector-borne diseases, increased allergens, impacts on water quality, um, impacts on how water and food supplies are distributed around the world, um, and the degradation of the environment in specific areas, as well as extreme heat. And so these, um, these uh, negative events have health impacts. So severe weather can cause injuries, fatalities, mental health impacts. Air pollution um, is associated with increased rates of asthma as well as cardiovascular disease. Um, changes in the way that communicable diseases are spread either between from human to human, from mosquito to human, or from animal to human, um, and increased uh, change, like uh, interactions between humans and these um, animals that have vectors can increase the incidence of malaria, dengue fever, encephalitis, um, all these other uh, diseases as well. Um, more allergens can also cause respiratory issues and asthma. Um, Problems with the water quality, so contamination of water due to rising sea levels um, can cause, or extreme weather can cause cholera, uh, cryptosporidiosis, or spiritiosis, um, leptospirosis, um, algae blooms, which we see a lot in um, the Caribbean. Uh, water and full food supplies are impact, which can cause malnutrition and diarrheal disease. We see this a lot in areas that are affected by drought. Um, and in these areas that have poor food and water supply um, and or are impacted by severe weather, you have things like forced migration, um, civil wars, and mental health impacts. So think about um, the earthquake in Haiti and the um, you know, amount of people that couldn't return to their homes um, and the amount of instability that happened following the earthquake. Extreme heat can cause heat-related related death and cardiovascular failure. So um, what is the link between climate change and disasters? Kind of getting to the second part of this presentation. So climate change disasters have increased in the last 20 years. Over 4 billion people have been affected, about 40% from flooding, 35% from droughts, and 18% from storms. It includes hurricanes as well as um, tornadoes and ice storms and snowstorms and that type of thing. Uh, 1.23 million people have died. Um, the highest fatalities are from earthquakes, which includes tsunamis as well. 16% um, from storms and 13% from extreme temperature. Uh, Caribbean countries have felt the brunt of the impact, such as the Haitian earthquake. Um, obviously, Indonesia, um, following the tsunami in 2004, was also a major impact. Um, disasters also have the highest impact on smaller economies, such as small islands that are in the Pacific and the Caribbean. And of the top 10 countries affected by economic losses, nine of them were islands in the Caribbean. So it's a very vulnerable region. So why is the Caribbean so vulnerable? 
So these small islands are infected by increases in temperature. Um, they have a larger proportion um, of the most intense tropical cyclones or hurricanes. Um, they're susceptible to storm surges because they're islands, um, droughts, uh, because they are also islands, they're surrounded by sea, um, uh, by seawater, which is not drinkable easily. So they are we're, um, usually dependent on rainfall for their water supply. Um, and these changing patterns, if they have um, a long period of drought and then heavy rain can cause mudslides and those types of things. Um, Sea level rise overall can erode their beaches, um, and most of these countries rely on tourism, so that is a very real issue for them as well. Coral bleaching can change um, the fishery industry and um, the uh, marine life, um, as well as uh, invasive species, so changes in water salination or temperature can bring new species to the area that typically wouldn't live there, migrating from other places um, that can um, overrun the area. And a lot of these changes are already detectable in the Caribbean and other places in the world. So what is the role of a disaster nurse um, because of these climate changes? So uh, we're going to talk about eight different roles, and I'm going to talk about one specifically. So the role of a disaster nurse, the first thing is proper planning and preparation. So um, disaster nurses have to be prepared personally. They have to be preparing for their family, so they have a plan in case there's a disaster that strikes them personally. They have to know what their facility's plan is, so if they work in a hospital or they work for the community, what is their role in a disaster? Are they supposed to report to the hospital? Are they there to relieve other workers that are reporting? Um, it's important to have a plan. Um, it's also important to remember that every nurse is a disaster nurse because the disaster can strike any community at any time and disaster response is always local first. It takes the time for um, military or humanitarian or other um, regional support to come in. So every nurse needs to be prepared. Um, communication is another big part. Um, Nurses have to be able to communicate with other providers, with other uh, interdisciplinary team members. Um, they have to be able to communicate in a way that is clear and doesn't induce panic um, and educates and supports their community. Uh, disaster nurses have to collaborate, so disaster management and disasters pull in people from all different types. Um, you know, first responders, police, political leaders, the military, humanitarian groups, um, utility workers like electricians, um, uh, people that work on the roads and the infrastructure. Everyone has to work together, tourism, education, everything. And so it's really important that there's a clear command structure so everybody knows who's reporting to who. Um, and so communication and collaboration can be streamlined and organized. So as a disaster nurse, you have to know what those communication structures are so that you can fit into them appropriately. Um, additionally, disaster nurses have to um, prioritize safety and security. So that means their own personal safety, not going in somewhere where it's unsafe, um, make sure that they are practicing safely, so within their scope of practice, within their abilities, um, as well as keeping themselves and others safe using proper um, infection control, personal protective equipment as well. Um, nurses also need to be able to do assessment. Um, so this is really at the core of who we are as nurses, but nurses have to be able to um, see and alert others of deteriorating conditions or events, um, whether it's the community or an individual that's deteriorating. They have to be able to do triage assessments in um, mass casualty scenarios. Um, and they also need to be able to assess and support vulnerable populations such as pregnant women, children, the elderly, and the disabled um, that may need additional assistance during a disaster. Nurses also need to be able to do interventions um, in a disaster scenario. This is usually basic first aid or maybe it's community health interventions like mass vaccinations. Um, they have to be able to isolate and identify any communicable diseases, um, decontaminating patients that may have been exposed to some sort of hazardous gas or chemical. 
Um, and then also being able to work with that team um, using their interventions within their scope of practice and not working beyond what they're trained to do. Um, nurses have to be able to work during the recovery phase, so after the acute disaster, um, working with patients and communities to restore them back to their regular level of health. Um, and then they also need to understand the law and the ethics around disaster practice so that they're able to work appropriately within their school scope of practice and use law and ethics to help um, make tough decisions uh, when resources can be scarce. So there's a lot that disaster nurses do. I'm going to focus on the assessment piece because I want you to leave this talk with something concrete that you can apply potentially to your own practice. So I'm going to teach you a method of disaster triage. So in this section, we're going to talk about the purpose of mass triage, understand how to systematically assess and prioritize victims, and apply mass triage to patients. So triage comes from the French word meaning to sort, and um, the goal of triage is when you're faced with more than one patient, you have to be able to afford the greatest number of people the greatest chance of survival. So uh, the benefits of good triage means that the most people are going to survive, ideally. Um, it's a way to kind of create control out of a chaotic environment using the same language and the same structure and priority for patients. Um, it lets you use the resources that you have the most efficiently, and it helps you make objective standards and decisions um, in a very stressful and emotional environment. So when do we use triage? Um, if you're an emergency nurse, you might use it in your regular practice. However, this is different than that type of triage. This mass casualty triage is for a disaster. So when a um, when a environment uh, or a, a, um, an event places a great demand on resources, both personnel or equipment, um, that would qualify as a mass casualty. So you have to understand what the assessment is of your system and what capabilities you have. Um, you have to be able to put your emergency operation plan in place. Um, and then triage is also um, influenced by the length of the event and the involvement of outside agencies. So if you have additional help to come in, they may be able to um, help with the triage process as well. So usually we prioritize using the color system. So red is priority one, meaning immediate care and life-threatening injuries. Yellow is priority two, which is delayed or urgent care, which can be delayed up to an hour. Green is priority three, which is minor or delayed care, which can be delayed up to three hours. And black is priority zero, which means that they're dead or mortally wounded or will be dead soon, and you don't provide any care. So in English, we use what's called the SALT triage method. So SALT stands for salt, sort, assess, life-saving interventions, and treatment slash transport. So the first thing you do in the SALT method is that you sort people based on whether or not they can walk and respond to you. So the first thing you do is you say, hey, if you can hear me, please walk over here. And so anybody that can get up and walk, they go over there and you look at them last. Then you say, hey, if you can hear me, just wave. And the people that are waving but can't walk, you're going to see them second. What you're looking for is the people that aren't waving, laying on the ground, and aren't really responding. You want to look at them first. So once you've identified that group, um, you find the patient that you think is the sickest, you look at them first. Um, you, uh, then you see if they're breathing or not, um, whether or not they're mortally wounded, um, and then you can kind of prioritize them that way. Um, I think there's a... No, there's not. Okay. Um, so the first thing you do is you see if they're breathing. If they're not breathing, they're black. Um, if they are breathing, you're going to look and see if bleeding is controlled, if they're in respiratory distress, if they have pulses, and if they can obey commands. If all of those answers are yes, and they're only minor injuries, then they are green. If they are more severe injuries, then they would be yellow. 
If any of those answers are no, meaning bleeding is not controlled, they are in respiratory distress, they don't have good peripheral pulses, or they're not able to um, obey commands, you ask if they're likely to survive with the available resources that you have. If the answer is yes, you make them red, they're immediate. If the answer is no, then they're black. It means that they will probably die soon and there's nothing you can do. So those that are red are going to be your first people that you want to try to help. So you do any late major life-saving interventions like opening the airway, controlling major bleeding, and if you're an advanced life support provider, you can do things like chest decompression with a needle or give an auto-injector antidote like um, epinephrine or... Um, <clears throat> Narcan or something like that. Um, the last step is treatment or transport. So red patients would be transported first, and then yellow and green patients would be transported afterwards. Um, the important thing is to coordinate and communicate with the hospital so that you're not sending all of the most critical um, patients to the same hospital. You have to spread them out so that they can get, have the best chance at survival with the available resources. Um, and then the patients that are still waiting for transportation or in route, you can provide um, whatever treatment you have um, on scene or in route. The most important thing, though, is that once you triage patients, you have to continually reassess them because they may change from a yellow to a red or from a green to a yellow or from a red to a black um, over time. So you have to keep looking so that you're giving everybody the best chance at survival. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so some of the things you can look at with your um, individual assessments um, so respirations, you can look at, you should, you probably know respirations 10 to 20 per minute is normal for an adult. Infants can be up to 60. If you see something outside of that range, that could be concerning. When you're assessing the pulse, you want to think, is it strong or weak? Can you feel it centrally or peripherally? And you want to look and see if there's any bleeding. And then when you're assessing mental status, you want to look, see if they're awake, alert, lethargic, confused, oriented, disoriented, um, and if anything is abnormal, then that would be concerning. So we already went through all of this. <clears throat> so we're going to do some practice cases here. So for example, we have a woman that has open fractures to both legs and has blood in her ears. Her respirations are 20 per minute. Her pulse is weak, but um, her Peripheral pulses are present. She's crying and she's following commands. So we ask, is she breathing? Yes or no? I would say yes, she's breathing. Does she have major bleeding? No. Respiratory stress? No. Peripheral pulses? Yes. Obey purposeful commands? Yes. So all of those are yeses. Um, all normal. So you go and see minor injuries. Well, she's got broken legs, so I would say that those are major, so I would give her a yellow. And here we have it. She's a yellow. This man um, has minor lacerations and bruising to his right knee. His respirations are 14 per minute. His pulse is strong, um, and he's asking you if you need any help. So again, we go to our algorithm and we see that breathing is fine. So we go down, major bleeding is controlled, yes. Respiratory distress, uh, not in respiratory distress, yes. Has peripheral pulses, yes. Obeys commands, yes. Only minor injuries, I would say, yes. And that would make him green. Priority three, minor care can be delayed up to three hours. Our third patient has chest pain and a short of breath. They're breathing 22 uh, breaths per minute. Their pulse is strong. Their mental status is slurred speech with some right-sided weakness. So we go through again, breathing, yes. Major bleeding controlled, yes. Respiratory distress, um, breathing a little bit fast. Pulses are strong. Mental status, um, we said that they had slurred speech, so that is a change in mental status. So I would say there are some no's. Likely to survive with available resources? Um, I would say potentially yes. Um, it sounds like they might be having a stroke or a heart attack. 
Um, so if you have a facility that knows how to treat those um, and is able to, then you would categorize them as a red priority one. Um, and our last example is patient number four. It's a two-year-old child with no visible injuries. The child is not breathing. The pulse is weak centrally. There's no peripheral pulses, and the child's turning blue from the neck up, and they're not responding. So you would see if they're breathing, yes or no. Um, you would say no. If this is a child, you would give two rescue breaths to try to see if they they would start breathing on their own. Um, but in this cat, this case, the child does not breathe. So um, this would be priority zero or black. So in summary, climate change is a real phenomenon that is impacting temperature, weather, and extreme weather events around the globe. And I want you to remember that every nurse is a disaster nurse, um, that disaster response is always a local response first, and that every nurse has to be prepared to be able to assist families, facilities, and communities with a disaster response. And then I hope you learned something about the SALT triage algorithm and how you can apply it if you're ever in a mass casualty situation where you're having to do um, triage. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day.